Hello, you're watching Talking Europe on France 24. I'm Catherine Nicholson. Now on the programme today, as new coronavirus restrictions are imposed in various parts of Europe, questions about when and how the economy will get going again. In the Eurozone, the economy shrank by almost 7% in 2020. And though growth is predicted in 2021, it's not going to be a so-called V-shaped recovery, according to the EU's own predictions. Well, meanwhile, recent holdups in getting Europeans vaccinated have raised questions over how this will impact not just public health, but the reopening of business. With us today from Brussels, the European Economy Commissioner and former Prime Minister of Italy, Paolo Gentiloni. Paolo Gentiloni, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Good morning. A big subject of the last few days, a shortfall in vaccine supply that's been a major frustration in the EU, of course, on health grounds, but also for people looking to get the economy open as well. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen talked on March 17th about issues with the AstraZeneca company and how to assure supplies for the EU's members. She said all options are on the table for the Commission. It expects uh, reciprocity from countries. It's exported vaccines too, which also produce vaccines themselves. Now, this includes potentially blocking EU exports of vaccines to the UK. Is the Commission launching a vaccine war here? First, we have to consider the reality. Uh, the reality is that um, the European Union is among the big uh, economic players in the world, uh, the one with the highest level of export of vaccines. So uh, uh, to define or describe the European Union, as a sort of protectionist or nationalist uh, block on vaccines is completely unfair. Um, it is absolutely the opposite. What we are asking for is reciprocity, mm. because, um, of course, also the, the European citizens are asking to be vaccinated mm. quickly, and uh, we deem important that all um, pharma industries that are producing vaccines in different uh, areas than mm -hmm. that the European Union contribute also to the vaccination in the EU. And this is the discussion that we had in previous days with AstraZeneca. Uh, <clears throat> now we have mm -hmm. transparency measures mm -hmm. that are only at the moment saying what kind of export we have and where they are going. Well, just to, um, well, you're this, talking I think, about, is useful for the... Uh, yeah, I mean, you're talking about transparency. Ursula von der Leyen used that word as well. But Dominic Raab, the British foreign minister, for example, he talked about brinkmanship. He said the commission is behaving like, uh, and I quote, countries with less democratic regimes than our own. He's questioning whether the EU is proceeding fairly. Well, my answer is very simple. Uh, we uh, have evidence of how many doses of vaccines were exported from the Union to UK uh, since we have this transparency mechanism. Mm -hmm. And this is 11 million doses. How many doses from the UK and from the UK uh, AstraZeneca plants, for example, were exported to European Union. Mm. My impression is mm. zero. Who is the protectionist? I think nobody is protectionist, but reciprocity is important. Just uh, continuing on the AstraZeneca issue, there has been a lot of dispute about the specific terms of the EU's contract with AstraZeneca compared to the contract that the UK uh, got, uh, especially in terms of guaranteeing supply to the UK. There are differences in the contracts. In hindsight, would you agree that the European Commission negotiated a less favourable contract? No. Honestly, I think this is not the problem. Um, I think we have very similar condition. Uh, and the problem, I repeat, is reciprocity. Mm -hmm. Then you can try to explain with this or that detail, mm -hmm. but this is not the case. Uh -huh. Now, on the economy more broadly, uh, on Thursday, just gone, Christine Lagarde, head of the European Central Bank, warned against, uh, quote, too much procrastination 
in delivering the 750 billion euros of fiscal stimulus agreed by the EU heads of state and government last year. Uh, in the last couple of days, the Croatian Prime Minister himself said that the process is very complex. Uh, do you agree that things are moving too slowly in getting this money to the member states? Well, I think that we have to ensure to make this process uh, quickly, but very seriously. Mm. Because we need from this common uh, debt issued for a common purpose in Europe, which, as you know, is a completely unprecedented decision, we need to give an added value. Uh, it is not only a fiscal stimulus. We had last year a very strong fiscal stimulus uh, coming from member states and enabled by our decisions mm. to suspend fiscal rules and to suspend state aid rules. Now we need, in 2021 and in the further two or three years, mm. to have an added value on the green transition, on the digital competitiveness, and on solving some issues that are slowing down growth in some European mm. countries. Mm -hmm. So we need speed, but also quality. And I'm sure that we will be able to have uh, within April uh, a large part of the plans presented by member states mm -hmm. and then with the process approved. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to look at one specific uh, source of funding that's already in use, the uh, support to mitigate unemployment risks in an emergency, also known as SURE. Uh, we have a report on this from our Brussels team that we'll look at together. Uh, now, uh, many member states benefiting from this programme already. It allows them to borrow money on advantageous terms to finance employment support measures. Uh, Belgium is a major beneficiary. Here's Alix Le Bourdon's report with Dave Keating. <laughs> this sentence might have seemed crazy to the boss of this laser game center a few months ago, but he's been using the ability to accommodate members of the same bubble, that is, from the same household, in order to revive his business, which had been shut down for months. It fills up the schedule a little bit, but only a very little bit. We're at 5% capacity. Since the start of the health crisis, Jérôme de Sombre has received around 1,600 euros per month from the Belgian state as a self-employed person. It allows me to survive, but not much else. My business is pretty much bankrupt. Faced with the economic shock, another type of aid is available to business leaders, additional unemployment. This employee works only one day a week. Extra unemployment payments also means it's possible to not lay off staff, and so it allows me to keep my job. This public aid has been made possible in part by the EU SURE program, a voluntary program which allows member states to borrow money on very favorable terms. Because of the crisis, this entrepreneur in tourism saw the closure of his travel agency. Today he depends on what the state pays him. I find it amazing that Europe has managed to get this done, but what bothers me is that this is a benefit payment that has no end result. I would prefer to receive some training. With a nearly 8 billion euros, Belgium is a big beneficiary of this European program. This is an important first step, necessary in the management of the crisis, but it is an insufficient first step. We must add to this crisis mechanism more structural measures in terms of labour law, we're thinking, in particular, of the European minimum wage. In all, 18 member states are benefiting from EU loans under this program for a maximum amount of 100 billion euros. Mr Gentiloni, uh, we saw that report there. The country you governed as Prime Minister Italy, uh, the biggest uh, single beneficiary from the Shore scheme, over 27 billion euros from those Shore coffers. Uh, just a question, though. What happens when all this money has to be paid back? Are countries storing up big debt problems for future generations to deal with? Uh, well, indeed, this um, Shore mechanism was a great success. Um, for I think for three reasons. One, uh, we addressed a, a very important problem, which is uh, support for jobs in this terrible crisis. Uh, 33 million of European workers were helped with this common European money. Mm -hmm. uh, second, it was very important because uh, it was uh, the first time that we were issuing common debt. 
for 100 billion, and it was a big success. Uh, 15 times oversubscribed the offer that we made of our European bonds for mm. sure. Uh, and third reason is that uh, despite the fact that these are loans, um, we had 19 European countries asking for this support. Mm -hmm. Of course, loans uh, need to be reimbursed uh, and we will repay uh, the common debt that we are issuing with new European own resources. In 2020, the Eurozone GDP shrank by a historic 6.8%. You predicted growth of 3.8% for the Eurozone this year. Uh, but given these delays in vaccinations we've talked about, is that prediction still realistic? I would say yes. We were expecting to uh, go more quickly uh, mm -hmm. towards the recovery. And we are, in fact, going to the recovery a little bit slower. But I am quite confident that... Uh, when recovery will strongly begin uh, with this uh, pent-up demand that we have, we will have level of growth uh, absolutely um, comparable to this around 4% for 21 and mm -hmm. 22. Of course, uh, vaccination and fighting the virus uh, remain of essence to relaunch our economy. That's all we've got time for. Thank you very much, uh, Paolo Gentiloni, European Commissioner for Economy. And thanks to you very much for watching as well. Hope to see you in part two of the programme in a couple of minutes' time.